Yo, what up, guys? We're on the clock. It's your boy Caleb back uh, with Trevor and uh, no Julian today, but we are joined by a very, very special guest. Um, you may know him as Chucking Darts. It's Chuck uh, from the Chucking Darts podcast. This has been one that I've been really, really uh, excited for to talk to you um, about some basketball, about some scouting. Um, you know, this is the Just Basketball Talk series. So um, we're kind of just going to go right into like a little bit about you and kind of how that builds into your draft philosophy and, and kind of your relation and connection to basketball. And maybe talk a little bit of darts at the end uh, for those who know. So um, we'll kind of just start at the beginning. Um, like what was your like first interest in basketball? Like kind of how did you um, like, did you have like, I remember distinctly kind of early on in my life. Like I, I saw like the NBA finals, like pretty consistently for a couple of years. And then I was like, Oh, this basketball things, you know, I really like this. Like, uh, and then I started to do more and more research. What was kind of that period in time for you? I, I just know a lot of people don't get to talk about it. Like, I'm sure that, you know, you've talked to, you've had hundreds and hundreds of, ep or 150 something episodes of your podcast. 150 will be probably in the next couple months. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you, I'm not sure you get to talk that often about kind of your beginning in basketball, but for me, I know that I'm genuinely curious. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for having me on your show. Uh, my, uh, it's just sort of now it's sort of the as far back as I can remember sort of deal with basketball, but um, I was never like very good at playing it. That uh, It never really came naturally to me, except I could shoot as a kid. I was, a, I was like a decent shooter because I had you know, a hoop in my driveway. And that's what I could practice on my own, like with no one else around. I, I had sisters growing up and they didn't hoop. So, but uh, I, I was a Knicks fan growing up, grew up on the East coast. And I remember what a lot of people remember. I remember playoff series. I remember, uh, you know, Jordan and that whole uh, just, phenomenon that swirled around him when he was legitimately like one of the five most famous people alive uh and nowadays like you know lebron and steph are very very famous and justifiably so but the 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 coverage and the um aura around them is not quite the same as it was with jordan it was he was a mainstream story those last few years more or less every time he took the court and uh that's what I remember. And and he was such a breathtaking athlete. And as a, I was a Knicks fan, but I was, I've always been an underdog fan really in any time I follow sports. And so there was just a lot of drama to me in trying to see if there was anyone that could ever dethrone Jordan uh, in those years when he was really at his peak. Uh, as far as college goes, I, I, uh, was like interested in college, interested in March Madness. I was just like a kid who liked sports, but I wasn't burying myself in it, like diving super deep in it, particularly uh, from a scouting perspective until uh, a couple years ago. But growing up, I went to a D1 school, I went to Wake Forest uh, undergrad, but I missed, I was there like a few years after Chris Paul was there. So I missed him. But I overlapped with like uh, James Johnson, Al Farouk Aminu. There was a, a Wake team that like low key got to the number one ranking in the country one year because they had Jeff Teague, Ish Smith, uh, Al Farouk, and James Johnson, all of whom got second and third contracts in the league. Um, but then their the team sort of flamed out down the stretch. They got a four seed. They got killed by Cleveland State in the first round of the uh, tournament. Um, but after sort of that, uh, my post-college life, my interest in really scouting the draft came about in 2018, that Luca draft. I wasn't, I didn't know how to scout and how to watch for scouting, but I thought it was very interesting that Luca was not the con consensus number one pick and wanted to figure out why that was. And, you know, if there were justifiable explanations as to why not, uh, what were those? And then the last, the next year you quarter, you sort of loop back around and Zion is this number one consensus guy at the time of the draft, but he wasn't at the beginning of the year, RJ Barrett was. And I was like, well, why is that? You know, why? <laughs> if you look at Zion, how do you come to any other conclusion ever? Um, 
And uh, 2020 was the year where I actually really tried to do it myself um, with the pandemic and uh, having a little bit of time in quarantine to sort of dive into the, that delayed draft. That draft was delayed, you know, six months. And the the book on that draft was, oh, man, what an off year. This is, you know, these guys are not very good. We just, you know, wake me up in June of 2021. We have to cover these guys for an extra six months. That's when I really started consuming, you know, podcasts about it, really uh, following the analysts on Twitter that I respected. Um, and when I decided to start my podcast, it was out of really questioning that conclusion that this t that the top of that draft was so uh like milk toast uh and to me you know i thought lamello was a really unique talent if nothing else i thought anthony edwards was a very unique athlete if nothing else mm -hmm. um and it was just stuff that i thought stuck out relative to other draft classes and 2020 had the distinction of having a lot of guys at the top that are a year earlier entering the NBA than most guys are. LaMelo, Killian Hayes, Patrick Williams, Anthony Edwards, and Poku all turned 19 in the second half of the year in which they were drafted. So they were like a young 19 as rookies, and that typically is something you don't see. And so I wanted to see, well, how positive a marker is that? Where are their skills relative to other guys the same age? And as you know, Caleb, with draft stuff, when you start to go down the rabbit holes, you like, you never come back up. And so I, I really haven't come back up since. So <laughs> that's, that, that's sort of my, that's my insane. story with it. That, that, that's phenomenal. I mean, thank you for sharing and the detail is incredible. I mean, definitely I was a year after you mm -hmm. um, and kind of like the process that you started where, you know, the first year where you had the Luca draft, you kind of dipped your toes in. You're like, Hmm. And the Zion draft, you're like, Oh, okay. Now I'm actually starting to form some like <laughs> yeah. questions that are researchable and I can kind of start to conceptualize, okay, what is kind of my philosophy? And um, so a big thing that you've kind of obviously built, you know, you have a, a great, a great name, like a podcast name for your name, you know, having the Chuck and Darts podcast, but also like the idea of a dart, like that can set, like, it's it's so accurate to and I've talked about this, I think, with this with Trevor is like at the end of the day, basketball is a very sport that's like it can it really swings one or two ways like it either really goes well for you or it goes poorly. And it's kind of like playing a game of darts or like, you know, the, in the draft lottery, not only is like the lottery itself at the end of the day, a lot of these guys, you're just kind of hoping that it works out. You know what I mean? Like you're put, trying to put the best pieces in the best scenario around them. You're trying to do your due diligence, but at the end of the day, you know, it's kind of just like chucking a dart, you could say. <laughs> so like, when did this, when did this like idea of like the dart and kind of define that? Like, what, what do you look at as a dart in the draft sense? So there's like two, there's like a double kind of meaning to it. One meaning is the, what you're talking about, which is the very earnest um, work that goes into coming to a conclusion that you can really stand behind and defend. Like the more that I've looked into um, all of this stuff and the more research I've done, I actually, the thing, I think that the, that careers are a bit more predictable than it seems. If you really know what to look for and what to evaluate. Now that doesn't mean that it's easy to rank appropriately because that's really difficult, you know, even for the the best scouts, it's really hard to rank someone's value at 18, 19 years old relative to another one's and know how the next 10 years will play out. Um, the other part of it is that I think that traditionally NBA teams have acknowledged that the draft is really hard, but they've also let themselves off the hook a little bit by saying that it's hard like if you look on the one hand everything with analytics and this data revolution about uh you know the efficient areas of the floors to operate in and score you know the sloan analytics conference all of the ink that's been spilled about uh, how the game is changing and has changed there's a lot of there's a lot of people patting themselves on the back for uncovering all this information and, the, you know, these franchises who think they're light years ahead and all that stuff. And I think that that's fair if people want to 
talk about, you know, what they've really gotten right. That's fair. But you turn to the draft and a lot of those same franchises and same people are like, well, who can say it's just, it's, it's random. You know, it's just, you're throwing a dart at the dartboard. So th- I think that the name is sort of a play on that, but what I hope it has sort of established is that um, you can be very specific with a prediction. You can, you can aim for a very particular target um, and it depends on how well you can really justify it, how detailed your work is, uh, how you're comparing your prediction to previous predictions in the past, how you hold yourself accountable. But that's sort of how you refine and get better at doing the draft. That's what I think a dart is, a short, sort of a constant improvement in how you evaluate and how you predict forward. You know, so many podcasts, and again, I don't, disparage them for this i listen to them just like everyone else does but a lot of podcasts are reactionary um and i they can be fun to listen to and that's cool but the only really like truly valuable analysis in basketball i would think is the ability to predict it forward and so that's what i try to focus on with the darts as well as always looking forward making forward looking predictions so yeah and i think i think you made a great point of that at the beginning of the podcast before we started recording Um, you know, and I'll kind of let you go back on the point. Uh, But, you know, kind of talking about how a lot of people and you know, I'm, I'm definitely in the spot right now where I'm not watching as much of the NBA game, but I'm definitely have like focused goals in this draft process. It's really my first process, like fully, fully scouting, diving Mm. and trying to like figure out what is my process to sift through prospects. So I'm definitely giving the college um, you know, game a lot more attention right now. I'm trying to figure out how, like, I just want to under- get a better understanding for like where guys will transfer, like kind of like some of that type of stuff, being able to uh, kind of look a couple of years ahead in the future, just in the college game itself. But, you know, we were kind of talking about how watching the NBA game is still very important, you know, as a scout to be able to understand where, you know, these guys are going to be playing and what skill sets are still applying. So like how, do you kind of like balance like, you know, guys playing really, really well at the college level, like kind of getting into like, I want to talk about Trey Murphy and kind mm. of, and and some of that stuff. Cause me and you share like that. And like, that was kind of my first like guy that where I was like, really, really was like emphasis on like, I was talking to a friend last night and it was really, cause I was, and I was telling him like, Hey, you're not going to believe this. Like this, this, this guy that I'm talking to tomorrow on this pod on my podcast, he actually like is the old, I think the only person that was a more outspoken or a bigger believer in Trey Murphy than me. And, <laughs> Cause I like had literally was watching, I was following Miami hoop school or something like that on Instagram for the longest time. And I had heard of, I'd seen this workout with this kid who went to rice or whatever. I was like, what is this? Like he was working out with Tyler hero and I just like saw his jumper. I saw one jump shot. I was like, okay, wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait a second. And then I saw, and then like a couple of clips later, it's him like getting like a lob, like what would be like a backside lob. Like I'm like, this kid's got absolutely unreal bounce. Are you joking? <laughs> Are you joking? Um, and then I'm mean, like, okay, he's a little stiff, but I mean, I just see it. Like I, I can see the, the, like, you know, I can see what, what the skill set is and what it could grow into. And kind of what, what was like, what was that like, like seeing him, um, you know, kind of make some of those jumps and then getting the chance to kind of sit down and talk to him. Like, how did that grow some of your appreciation for basketball? Um, a great deal, certainly. I mean, my, first of all, Trey's a, a, like a wonderful guy and a wonderful kid. And he uh, was very gracious in in giving me some time to sit down with him before the season. But In terms of his particular evaluation, um, so that was 2021, and that was a like the draft that at the time, like, and I still feel this way. I just thought it set a new standard almost for the depth of talent coming into the league, because again, traditional, and I won't say lazy. Like there is data to back a lot of this up, but traditionally, like if you don't have a pick in the top 10 or the top 12, it's like, Oh, well, we're just looking for maybe a guy who can be in a rotation for a couple of years. Like, yeah, the, all most picks after pick 
10 bust anyway like who really cares or do we really want to pour a lot of resources into this and blah 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 um and just in looking at that 2021 class uh the, I just thought it was so deep. I thought that the athletic bar was higher than it had been. And in Trey specifically, I was like, I I remember like I had him um, aware a lot of people had him like late first round, you know, maybe between 15 and, and 20 where he got picked. Uh, and then right around, you know, I was just doing some work in April or whatever. And I was looking at these other guys, you know, Kaminga, Barnes, um, Jalen Johnson, Kai Jones. I played AAU against Jalen Johnson. You did? Yeah. Well, I wasn't on the same court with them, but I like my, and in, in, in theory, I played against them. Like, I mean, we were in the, <laughs> we were in the same tournament, different level, but it was cool. How, how was he in person? Oh, I mean, he was an incredible athlete in like that early high school. Like he was, he was the number one player, like one of the number one players in the country. Like yeah. honestly, he, um, at that point he was far and away the number one player in the state of Wisconsin, but he was like just a better athlete than everybody. He was six foot six. Like when everybody else was like five eleven to six foot, <laughs> like he was, he just didn't belong in the middle of Wisconsin. Like he didn't, he didn't belong in Southeast Wisconsin. That's for sure. <laughs> cool cool yeah well and he i think one of the reasons and i like jalen i had jalen in the top 10 in that draft and i'm glad to see him coming along now in his second year with atlanta He's got a great skill set. Like, he yeah. does he does but i think uh when i was comparing trey to all those guys eventually i was just like i like unless kuminga for example unless kuminga is going to be a star like a capital s star um I would just rather have the like the six ten wing athlete who shoots in a different universe than he shoots. So maybe there's a better chance. Maybe there's a better chance of John Kaminga making um, first or second team All NBA one day than Trey Murphy. But if that percentage is a four percent chance to a two percent chance lots of people in the draft states would be like well that means you take Kaminga first you always want to maximize the potential of getting the most valuable possible player um I didn't really feel that way number one because I do think that fit matters a ton and number two it like looking at all of those wings and going through that draft um gave me a, a new appreciation for what potential really is like and a lot of a lot of times um, analysts will use sort of uh, just athleticism as a rough synonym for potential. Um, and Kaminga was sort of he like divided opinion because he didn't play that well in the G League. Like Jalen Green had sort of clearly outplayed him by the end of it, but he was still really athletic. I mean, Jalen Green's just I mean, yeah, J Green's incredible, but I think. With Murphy, if if I'm trying to not ramble too much here, but like Murphy had had very valuable things that he was clearly already very good at, and I think for guys who are shot forward, whose whose games revolve around their jumper, if they're not breaking people down off the dribble, uh, I think a lot of times analysts perceive a ceiling on that. Like, oh, well, he's only ever going to be a spacer. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, he's he, he might be able to guard, but his game isn't really going to expand and grow in these interesting directions. When the truth is, for 20, 21-year-olds, as long as you get NBA court time early and you're you're a starter by 22 or 23, that means by age 27, you're like starting for five years anyone's game can grow in an interesting direction and kuminga to me was always like okay how quickly is he going to get on the court and be a positive player how long is that really going to take not just showing flashes here or there because there's a reason that you know moses moody got time in the playoffs for the warriors last year and kuminga really didn't like you need to help the team win and 
with the draft, especially if they go to eliminate the one and done to where 18 year olds can enter the draft again, they go back to that life. There are so many 18, 19 year olds who have interesting parts to their games that are not really ready to help a team win. And how a particular team decides to value that um, is really interesting to me. But Trey was sort of a, a good balance between all of that because he was still pretty young. He had the athleticism to stick and really help. And he was uh, rare because most wings in the league, you know, are between 6'6 six, six or 6'5 six, and 6'8. That's and he what, was, I, that's he what was easy 6'9, six, easy 6'10. Six, like, yeah. So I thought it was, I thought it was no brainer. And I mean, I didn't make a board um, for that class. Um, last year was my first year making like an actual full board, like going through the whole process, you know, looking at prospects, but I had like a, I had like a top six or whatever. And I had Murphy at six. I had, mm -hmm. I had green one Mobley two, Cunningham three. And that's, that was like, that was my, my firm pat thing about it. And then, you know, I went out and then I was Paulo Chet, um, I was Paulo Chet Jabari this this past year as well. So I I was I don't know I, that 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 trade thing. I thought that was what so thing? cool. I love that pod. I mean that was a great pod for anybody that you know is looking to listen. Um, you know Trey has such an interesting story in its own. Like um, you know kind of his rise to um, and I think you did a great like some of the questions you asked. Like you just led him in such a perfect direction. I think he's a natural storyteller as well. He'd be he's a guy that I'd, I'm sure will eventually be on the JJ Reddick pod at some point. And um, or he could have his own if he wants no, it. Absolutely, I mean, he's, he's good he's, enough. Yeah. yeah, he's he's a very like I mean, a per college graduate. If I'm not mistaken, I, I think he is pretty pretty close, or at least was in college for. I think three years uh, he I, I bet if he wanted to get his degree yeah, he could yeah, do it I, I'm quickly sure he get his degree i mean yeah yeah smart guy and articulate storyteller i enjoyed a lot of that pod um but kind of one moving thing, into one into thing i wanted that. to ask about yeah, really quick um i really like the comparison with kaminga and the impact of and i think it's glaring the situational difference right going to a place where new orleans they're going to give him a chance versus obviously the warriors have nine to ten guys in front of Kaminga that aren't you know like you mentioned the the point about um who am I thinking about now you mentioned the point about uh what's his name playing in front of him so oh Moody uh, yeah. Moody thank you yeah. um but really it's more about understanding I think Murphy went to a really good place and I was just more curious about how and I was talking to somebody about this the other day I'm curious where you are on it is how much do you take into consideration a fit conversation obviously when you do mock drafts and things that matters but how much in your evaluation, do you take and really understand fit? Because I know you mentioned we pre-pod, like Caleb said, the NBA conversation we had. It's understanding where the game is going, and that matters for a guy like Murphy. He went to the perfect situation. So how much do you value the fit of a guy when you are evaluating them? Uh, it's hard because fit's a slippery – it's a slippery word. It can yes. mean a lot of different things. I think if – fit should not mean – team drafts player to solve a problem on the team that almost never works because the kid's going to be young and he's not going to be the version that the team wants him to be for another two three years probably anyway um but putting a player in an environment where their growth is going to be uh most sort of cared for and accounted for Put in, put in the best position to grow in the best way. That is very important uh, to me. And um, it, like, I don't know if this is a conversation I was having with friends this week. I don't know if this is a like a one-to-one -one comparison. I may be like really out, out in the stars here. But one of my buddies was watching like the Redeem Team documentary. And <clears throat> we were kind of chuckling because... It's just like, like, it's great that the U.S. won. That was a really exciting Olympics. And that's a cool, like, bit of branding, the Redeem team and whatever. Um, but it's just like, <laughs> the U.S. should win the gold medal all the time. Like, again, just heaping glory on yourself for being the favorite and then winning is just sort of kind of a little much to me. But in lots of Olympics um the the finals are very competitive i mean they usually are including in that year where they had you know 
they have every star you can imagine. They play Spain and that game is really, really, really going down to the wire because Spain knows how to play together. And uh, if you translate that, like the common refrain in draft circles, right, is best player available, best player available. You got to take the talent, figure it out later. I think there are certain draft spots where that is absolutely the case. Usually the very top of the draft, you just want to take the best talent. If for no other reason, you want to keep that talent from being on another team. You want to keep them away from the rest of the league because you're going to have to play them. So if someone thinks, oh, well, I don't know if Victor Wembenyama is like a fit for what we do right now. Great. He's going to go somewhere else and you're going to have to beat him and it's going to be a real problem for you. But when you get away from the top of the draft, I think that there is a there's an issue with best player available because if you translate it to an Olympic context, like if if basketball were all about best player available, then these Olympics would not be remotely competitive. They would be demolitions all the time. And they very, you know, and they're not. So it's just understanding how a young player, what they need in their game to grow. I think I said this in my first episode when I was trying to be all, you know, haughty and high and mighty. I was like, it's not about what a player can do for a team. It's about what a team can do for a player. So that's that's sort of how I look at fit. So if you are going like to that. draft someone, um, but you're going to ask things of them that they aren't ready to do, then the fit is bad, but that is the team failing the player, not the other way it's around. Two way street. That's yeah, good. I like that. And, I like the Olympic comparison too. Yeah, and like and like Wiseman in Golden State um, is a great example because they don't, you know, they've never been a pick and roll team, and so what are you like? He he was a pick and roll guy, and even that he was raw at. So how are you setting up this kid to succeed? You know, what, what is really the thought process? And you read stuff like, oh, Joe Lacob had dinner with him. And, and you're just like, oh, my God. How, like, how are you making such important decisions based off stuff like that? But on, on Trey to the Warriors specifically, um, I don't know, man. If they took him at 14, and Trey went 17 in that draft. If they take him 14 instead of Moody, I don't, I don't think Trey's buried on that team by now. I no, think he, I mean, I think he's playing is, for him plenty. Would you, would you uh, my biggest problem with him getting drafted to the Pelicans was like, I mean, I would have been like, I really kind of wanted him to go to any other team because I wanted him to get minutes. And they kind of have like Brendan Ingram and I, mm -hmm. and they already had drafted, you know, they also got Herb Jones, obviously. And like, I was like, you know, there's a lot of wings here. There's a lot of, but it's, I was like completely just, not surprised that his ability to just rise up that rotation just because of his ability to stretch the floor and space the floor. And when you talked about like kind of teams looking at guys and capping their ceilings as floor spacers, I mean, when you look at offenses in the NBA, you really just like you're throwing three floor spacers out there with maybe a, a rim runner and a, and a guy who's a primary creator, like, and hopefully a couple of those spacers are secondary creators and, or can put the ball on the floor a little bit. And, you know, all the guys you want to be defense and around six, eight to six, 10. So, I mean, <laughs> it seems like it's, yeah, it's crazy how teams could uh, overthink it to that point, I think. Um, but kind of moving into, you kind of already started to do it, but who are some, uh, for me, I mean, you know, kind of along the same vein as Dalen Terry, or like, da I was going to say Trey Murphy, but Dalen Terry is a guy that um, was kind of like a late riser for me, similar mm -hmm. to how Trey Murphy was when I just like, I look at like where the league is going, especially like the expectations, the things that you have of a point guard, um, like, you know, six, seven, you know, long wingspan can get to the basket, puts the ball on the floor or can do a lot of different things. Um, you know, he kind of is on in a situation with the bulls similar to like a guy like Kamingo where he's playing um, on a team that's trying to win now, like obviously. And I just, I don't know. I, I, I kind of, I look at a lot of the guys that get drafted into situations. I, 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 it's interesting to see how many aren't ideal. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. it's not surprising to see like guys, you know, fl not do well in their first year. I mean, looking at guys like Larry Markinen come up, come to mind. Like, I mean, there's a lot of guys in their with their first team, Bull Bull. I mean, another one, mm -hmm. the first or second teams just don't get, um, you know, do you think it's a freedom thing or do you think it's more of a confidence thing? Um, can be a lot of stuff like 
Chicago's a good example because I I loved Patrick Williams in the draft. I did an episode a couple of episodes a ago. A couple of guys in the past couple of years where they yeah. just, they don't give them quite the look they deserve. Well, and so they have you know they made a trade like a trade to push if not all their chips then at least a lot of them in to get Nikola Vucevic, and so that means that. You know, Vooch, Levine, DeRozan, these are going to be our high minute guys. These are who we are playing through. Everyone else has to accommodate what they are doing. Like we want to try to win. And so when your usage is already that defined on that team, everyone else, it's just can't, how do you help us on the margins? And that is like a really tough place for a prospect to be because prospects need to fail. They need to make mistakes in order to get better. And they, that means they need to be given intentionally a bit more than they can chew so that they can grow. And uh, with Dalen specifically, he was another guy. He rose for me a lot to the point where I was thinking about having him in my lotto last year. Then I eventually moved him a little bit further back down because he was even though he was a very positive player for Arizona, like clearly good. And uh, you heard all this wonderful Intel about him in the draft process. And he, you know, he could play two. Yeah. The comment. Yeah. And he played, you know, two ways and all that stuff. He, you know, at Arizona, he took a backseat usage wise because he only scored, I think, nine points a game. His so- his last five games were like really good. And he averaged like 15 a game. And those were really, really encouraging. And it, I don't think that anyone really thought it was that he was incapable of doing more. But I do think it matters what a prospect ends up being comfortable doing. If someone prides themselves on doing like the dirty work and <clears throat> filling in and doing all of that, when they get to the NBA, it's not like it's just a a golden paved road and you just have every everything, every opportunity to explore whatever flight of fancy you want. Like you're going to be on a team and a team's going to say, what do you do well? What do you do? How do you help us? And for Dalen just as an example, he probably has in his mind, well, I could do tons of things to help you if you just give me minutes. Like I could find out all these different ways, but if it's the difference between playing and not playing, it'll be like, well, I can play off the ball. I can attack a closeout. I can do connecting, you know, I can make connecting passes really well. uh, And I'll stay out of the way of your stars. You know, that's how, that's how I'm going to try to carve out any sort of niche. And that's another thing that I've, uh, between this past cycle and this one that has changed for me is understanding the importance of what players are comfortable doing on the floor. Some players are restless and they are going to claim more and more usage for themselves. Not like it's tempting to say in a selfish way, but it's not. It's just like, I am going to shape this team around my game because I believe that is the best thing for the team, not just for myself. And the guys who were wrong about that, their teams don't really win and they're not big draft prospects. The ones who really are right about that, you can see a greater path towards them becoming a starter in the NBA. Quentin Grimes, good example, goes to Houston. He's not the point guard, but he ends up putting up 14 threes per 100, something, some absurd number. And that is because number one, he could do it, but number two, because he, I'm sure he got the green light in Houston, but you could tell he was so confident in his ability to score and dictate their offense in that way. And Dalen, that was my question is how does he establish himself as a threat to score? What areas of the court is he most comfortable attacking? How quickly does he get to the point where he is a credible threat at one level, two level, three levels against the defense. Cause in the league now, if you Not are really in the half court right now, yeah. I mean, that, but that's the whole game. It's if, if an NBA team is willing to ignore you, they'll ignore you and you have to make them pay until they pay attention. And so that, that's sort of, that was sort of where I ended up on Dalen, but a super interesting guy. Cause if you're in this class and he were six, seven and he were at Arizona still right now, 
he'd probably be averaging, you know, 13 or 14 a night, you know, probably like 14, eight and five and something. And he would get a lot of lotto consideration deservedly. So, so, you know, yeah. I I just, I think with Chicago, it's just, it's, it's going to be tough to see um, where he kind of fits in long-term. Cause like I said, I mean, just him in the half court is not the greatest thing in the world right now. He just really needs to shoot it a lot better. But I mean, for them to be a team that like when, when he's thriving, especially when you've seen him at the G league and even in his his spot minutes in the NBA and like in, in the preseason there, they were doing well with him on the floor and Javante green. And when they were really getting out and Mm -hmm. trans. I think that that's something that that I was expecting. Maybe I should have have been expecting because they play Vucevic so many minutes. But I just kind of want them to see them get on transition more and be. Uh, like, I I I think a lot of people want to see <laughs> a lot of different things out of the Bulls. I think <laughs> that's fair to say. Yeah. I like that Caleb brought up Terry, and this is a really good uh, transition for Julian's question, who couldn't be here with us, unfortunately. Our our uh, other leg of OTC. Uh, my just to understand the question, my part of Terry, I, I like that you two were in the same vein. I was, I think people were falling in love with the archetype, not the player, a little mm-hmm. bit more. So I had him a little bit outside the first round. Um, but I think Julian's question uh, fits that understanding. Do you feel like there are certain archetype or positions in total, comparing the NBA and the draft, putting them together, that have a higher success rate in the league? Is there something that you look for and you go, that's what's working for me personally, and then what's working in the league consistently? And obviously, that can change. The league evolves mm-hmm. and changes all the time, even yearly sometimes. I think Dalen Terry is a good example of a guy who had that archetype type of feel for me. Is there yeah, somebody or an example that fits that for you? It's hard to say um, because archetype, like I think it's another slippery word. Cause like I could say, well, sword, if, for sure. if, if it's players that do X, Y, and Z, but then I'm just talking about skill sets. And then we're just talking about, you know, how well do they play basketball. If you're talking about like, I think that an archetype that usually, so like I, something I used to say a lot about LaMelo during his rookie year and everything. And then I used it to apply it to Josh Giddy the next year is that if you're, if you're big and you can distribute and you're young, you're going to make it. That's not, you, you don't fail. No one ever fails. If you're, uh, and I think I use like, you're over six, six, you've made it to the NBA like before you're 20 and you can, you can get four or five assists a game. Like there isn't, no one flames out. You would say, Oh, what about Michael Carter Williams? Michael Carter Williams was 22 when he entered the league. So when you do sort of research like that, there are certain, you, you find certain bars that players can clear, but in terms of reaching like all-star status or all NBA status or something like that, I don't really know that I have an archetype that points to that stuff. I I have ways to eliminate people from that conversation, but I don't have ways to propel someone to the front of that conversation unless they're like screaming at you and it's Zion and you like, it's just gonna, it's pretty obvious, you know? So like when you, when you say, um, sorry, I just, kind of like could you just repeat that point again like um you see when so you kind of put it in reverse i guess like of, of what julian was asking so like what is a one thing that you would say like that you would take away like what what's one thing in a prospect that you say is like a red flag i guess sure um i think i mean unfortunately this is sort of like brutally simple but a lot of it has to do with height if you're under again if you're under Let's say six five. Let's just pick that one. If you're under a if you're under a listed six five and you're listed as six four or shorter, then you better be like just incredible. You you better make it so that no one could screw up taking you. And so like Cole Anthony would be an example of this. So like number one high school prospect in the country at one time has some injury concerns at Duke. You, no, UNC, sorry, at UNC, and is like, has some really good games, like certainly flashes and is a first round talent and shows skill and has in much in the same way in the NBA has had his moments in his first couple of years. But if there's anyone out there who like still believes that Cole Anthony could one day be an all-star, I would disagree with them because the what you need to do to get to that level 
is essentially like really be able to either play two ways, number one, and Cole's never going to be a very good defender, or you need to be one of the 10 or 15 best offensive players in the world. Like the, the bar, if you are a mediocre defender, the offensive bar is just so, so high. And so I think like being just a solid or, or like a, a pretty good point guard prospect that can be an eliminator for me. Either you are a a star at point or you are you better like be able to play defense. Like that that's sort of one. But it's, it's I guess it it'd probably be better to go like player through player about what how you sort of get eliminated from the discussion, but um I don't know. If you have been shooting threes poorly for like two or three years in college, chances are you're not going to be a really good NBA shooter that too. I mean, that's another one. And it like that stuff sounds super intuitive and like obvious, but you'd be surprised in the draft community about how much debate there is about guys like that. That might apply to someone like book night book night had a ton of fans, got all this top 10 buzz, ended up going 11th to Charlotte. And I don't want to write book night off as an NBA contributor or anything, I liked him fine, but I had him outside the lotto in that class. And he, I think he shot 35% from three, uh, his freshman year, 32% his sophomore year. And his like free throws were fine, nothing great. And he wasn't a distributor. So now you're looking at an off ball, six, five guy who's not going to really guard wings. What, who does he help? What stars does he help? How does, how is he going to help a team? And that's sort of, it's just sort of questions like that, you know. It, it's really player to player. I like the under six five thing because looking at my first, just like in general, I have a big prospect list in front of me. Scoot Henderson's six foot two, right? But we know what he I can do a, across the board, I was, right? I was gonna say I put out a tweet the other day and I I actually asked. I said, "How many players do you have?" An, I saw that. That was good. Yeah, six the, four. The next guy down the list is you know thirty to forty spots later. Marcus Sasser's the next guy that's six two. So I guess I didn't even like see that. And I'm glad that you talked that out to see, like, okay, it's not a red flag per se. It can be, but it's like, okay, what are you doing for me if you're not six foot five yeah, or more? And I think I the, like pros- the prospect to apply that to in this class is Turquavion. Mm. How how special is Turquavion? Yeah, like that, it's that sort. That's and- that's why I said six four because I I knew I wanted yeah. to see. I like oh, there's enough people that'll have George Scoot Turquavion, mm. and then kind of that's three, and I was just kind of see yeah. curious to see other three were but continue your point about turk oh, i'm curious it, it's just that i i have i watched a good amount of him last year because he stayed in really right until the end and i liked what i saw but he's so young and um i've watched a little bit of him this year but haven't really done my homework on him yet to see the changes in his game his stat profile is great very encouraging in a lot of defense, ways the defense has been awesome the interior finishes please do, he's got, please he's do, put on please some, do it it's worth it his frame so yeah. I was a guy that was pretty high on him last year. I think you'll be impressed. Yeah, so I, that's where if Turk, if he looks like he can really guard two positions, if he's going to be able to guard, you know, whatever, just guard two positions in the league, yep. then, yeah, like you could see him as lotto top 10-ish kind of talent with everything else that he can do. Like, how does he compare to Bones Highland? Who would you like more as a prospect, him or Bones? How uh, bullish are you on Bones as an eventual NBA starter? In in a redraft, does Bones go in the top 15 or 20? The, like the, that. All the, that, that kind of stuff is what I would apply to Turk. I'm looking forward to hearing. I'll send you an email in about a month and a half and ask you uh, how you like him because Caleb and I have talked about him plenty because I live in Raleigh and get to enjoy <laughs> his play quite a bit. And it's somebody that I'm trying to be careful about. I don't want to overstep anything as a fan. I want to make sure that I'm careful and, and seeing both sides of the ball there. So I'm looking forward to hearing as somebody who so far are talking to you, obviously I trust your opinion, on a lot of this stuff. So I'd love to hear how you end up on him. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to get into like kind of some dark stuff, but I think it'd be some, some good philosophy, like philosophy question, like philosoph- philosophically based answers, like for some of these questions that I have for, especially for this class, I think like, what what where are you at right now in a like conversation of Turk versus like Chris Murray? Uh Turk, I would probably prefer how, to how Chris- far how far apart do you think they they would be? Like um, where are you at on Chris Murray right now? I I like Chris a lot. 
Um, I haven't, I, the last game of his I watched was him against Duke a few weeks ago. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know quite what stat lines he's been putting up since then, but um, Chris, I think like he's, those Murray twins are so interesting because I like initially Keegan was a defensive prospect. That's how he first sort of made his bones at Iowa. But by the time the draft rolled around, I thought his best tool by far was his shot like that. That was where he was going to return top 10 value. And that is how like the Kings are really using him. They're using him as a play finisher, a movement shooter, and someone who can um, like really be scheme sound on defense, really execute. Not really. I mean, he doesn't deter a whole lot, but he can be in the right spot. Yeah. Um, and Chris to me is like an even more extreme version of that, where I think his touch is actually, I mean, I don't know if it's better than Keegan's, but it's like right there. And when they're at Iowa, I actually am playing together. I thought Chris had better touch than Keegan did a lot of the time in the games that I watched, but all of the sort of kind of stiffness that Keegan has as an athlete, Chris is, has that and a little bit more. So if you put him in the NBA and you're the temptation, especially the last few years is to be like, well, he's a wing, he's a wing, you know, wing, 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 wing. And if you're a wing that, like can't really guard in space, then you're probably going to be a bench player. And that can be cool and that could help. But if you're comparing it to a guy like Turk, the the question with Turk is, is he good enough to be sort of um, two, two answers? One is like sort of the one player under six, five on a really good playing unit, like a starting five or a closing five. Cause that was what I noticed in the playoffs last year is you look at that final eight golden state, their one player that was under six, five for most of their minutes was Steph. He could play with Jordan pool, but pool ended up being a liability. The further those playoffs went and it was usually Steph Wiggins, clay Draymond Looney, or, you know, with some sub up there, he was the shortest guy jaw on Memphis shortest guy um maxi on the sixers shortest guy uh lowry on the heat same thing uh marcus smart boston same thing like so um, it if you're if if turk is good enough to occupy that role on a team then he would be like that's a lotto pick if he is not quite that good but he can still win his minutes consistently, which is another avenue for him, then I would still pretty clearly prefer him to Chris because Chris is just going to sort of be a gap filling wing. But there are like what I would call minute winners at guard in the league. Like Alvarado is a minute winner. TJ McConnell, minute winner, quickly minute winner. I like the Bones uh, Island you know, one too. Bones, Bones, Island is, Bones, Bones Island is too. I think that's a good one. So I would need to I would need to check out Bones is doing this year. I I, I I haven't like followed his lineup numbers and everything with him, but because those other guys, a distinguishing factor about them is that they all defend very very well, uh, okay. especially particularly a point of attack. So if I am if I agree with y'all about Turquavion's defense and that he's really that like that is really taking a step up then you would say that, well, at the very least, he's going to win his minutes. And then we just see where everything else takes us. And as long as like those players, that's a mistake I've made in the draft the last couple of years, because I look at, well, if I do this starter guard thing, if they aren't screaming that they're a star at guard, then I'll just, I'm going to be lower on them than most people are. But Nemhard, Alvarado, quickly, all guys that I was too low on, come in win their minutes and are like clearly valuable to their team then that's an archetype so to speak that you want to move up and i think that that is more valuable than sort of a wing who looks the part but is not going to who's just going to be a low usage guy and that's that's where i kind of see chris as is a low usage nba player but a low usage one I have Case and Wallace surprisingly high on my board right now. Do you feel like that's like something like what what is your thoughts about him? He's had a crazy start shooting the ball. And I think that that was probably the biggest thing that 
people were going to have a question about. And I think that the biggest thing that's disappointed me so far, at least, is the playmaking isn't probably at where I thought it was preseason. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think he's as good of a distributor or as, as sure of a, a lead ball handler. But, like, some of the, the off-ball movement, some of the relocation ability that he's shown, like – um, some of it's pretty impressive. Like I, I, I have them out, out myself. I have them as a top seven pick right now. Like I, and it's kind of like, and why I ask is cause it's under the same thing. Like I look at these Thompson's and I look at, um, you know, I look at the Millers and I look at the Lewis's and, you know, we'll kind of get in talks about like Jalen Wilson, Jalen Clark, and some of those guys. But like, I, I feel like, he's kind of like a, a sure thing on defense, like as, as close to a sure thing. And at least I feel like in, in terms of guards on defense and maybe besides Sasser in this, um in this class, and then adding in kind of the ability to be an off ball player, have that, like you look at a guy like Marcus smart and mm -hmm. his ability to provide, you know, even an ounce of space. And I, I picture case and Wallace, on that team, I don't know if he's as impactful as a defender, as a rookie, as smart is, as an NBA, like a longtime NBA veteran, obviously, and defensive player of the year, not to compare them, but I, like, I find it hard to believe that he shouldn't be considered kind of in this top, like, upper, of like, lower part of the top 10 range because he has such a skill set that you know even though he is six four like we've been talking about these guys like I can see him being a guy who's either a minute winner or is in you know a closing lineup for a playoff team you know five years from now yeah so doesn't he have pretty dramatic three point free throw splits he's like yeah, 45 percent from three and like 65 from the line or something like, like that. it's like almost it's almost like 50 yeah. like like 60 yeah. So I don't know. I'll say that I don't have an, an opinion on Kaysan yet because I haven't done my Kentucky sort of dive. I usually put that off because I I recommend to do the Euro as well. <laughs> OK, yeah, I it's just yeah, something about Calipari's and how that team plays just I just need to be in the right mood to watch it. So <laughs> but I'll say that with Kaysan as a defender. Who does he usually defend? Is he usually pretty strictly point of attack or does he defend in the post? Does he like rim protect weak side as well as, uh, you know, switch through the lineup? How do they use him? How do they deploy him? Yeah, he's kind of just a point of attack guy. Like they're, 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 he's got great hands and mm -hmm. he's got good lateral quickness. I think I think his underrated thing is his footwork. I think he's got a good ability to turn his hips and kind of, you know, he he gets a lot of steals where the, the guy is just kind of, you know, trying to attack him really quickly, speeds himself up, and he's kind of able to, you know, reach a hand in. I think he's got probably, you know, long arm. I, I don't know what his wingspan is, but I'd assume like plus, plus three, plus four, probably on the wingspan. So he's got good reach, can get some good steals and stuff like that. But I, I think something that I'd like to see is some weak side rim protection. I think that he's got that type of length that's kind of, you know, rare for a guard. Um and and it's just because like they have Shibway, they'll play Shibway and drop. Like I, I don't know. It's it's a, nothing that hasn't been said about Kentucky before. Oh, I won't belabor the point. Correct. But like they've been, they've yeah. been really frustrating me. Under, yeah. Understanding, uh, understanding. No, Col no Collins minutes. Barely any Livingston minutes. No Thiero minutes. Yeah. So um. Their lineup, their lineup compositions are all just weird. Like, so how, what is Kason listed at? Six four. Six four. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look. I remember this time last year. How do you think he compares? Again, he's listed as much taller than this person, but to Kennedy Chandler last year. He's he you can tell that he's significantly like a bigger player than Kennedy Chandler. Like okay. he, he like his length, it, it definitely he plays like he's like you'd think that he's like six five, six six because of some of that length. I think it gives him an extra inch or two of perceived height. Um, which I mean is always a positive thing, but um yeah, I just found that when he came in, I was like, this could be like, when I watched him play in the Bahamas tour, I'm like, he gave me Drew Holiday vibes because he was kind of like a pacey um, guy on offense, like the way he uh, just very in control with the ball in his hands. And then just kind of the the playmaking stuff didn't translate into the college season as much as I thought. And I think it's mostly just because on offense, he's playing kind of an off-guard role with, yeah. because Wheeler is. And which, I mean, again, like you said, the Kentucky 
situation is weird. And I don't know how it's going to get any better. They don't want, their team next year is going to be 10 times weirder with how the yeah. and the When goal. he gets the ball, it, you said he's off guard. Does he get the ball to like catch and shoot a lot? Or how well does he get himself to the line? That would so, be my next question. So I think a lot of the, the getting to the line stuff is in transition. Uh, I think yeah. that that's his, his main way to get to the line. But how he's creating three-point opportunities for himself is actually like like the biggest thing that I'm interested in is he's – got a very great feel for you know like i said relocation like he he's able to you know make a pass like a swing pass and kind of figure out all right i'm gonna make you know an interesting cut and he's got very good timing with like kind of how he moves where he'll he'll kind of do give the ball off to the guy on the top of the key you know give a little v cut and just kind of like drift back out slowly and just get it and shoot. He's got a surprisingly quick release. Yep. I think a lot of it is feel and timing. Um, I think he's just experienced. I think he's an experienced scorer. He's probably been one of the, you know, just better players on the court. You know, most of these guys have been the better, one of the better players on their court in most games that they played. So, but he, yeah. he just got that kind of, kind of a natural scores feel that I wasn't expecting from him, but yeah. I think he's an interesting guy that I'll be, um, you know, watching and it'll definitely be a philosophy dictator for me um, going forward on kind of how I'm valuing my guards, especially at that, that top 10 range. I, I think it'll be a, cause I mean, right now I have them above, you know, the Thompsons and GJ Jackson and Anthony black, which is, um, you know, I mean, that's pretty good air at this time of year to be uh, mentioned in. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing, like I, I, so much of this stuff, when you when you get deeper and deeper into it, you start to talk about like, well, percentile outcomes and what are, let's really view it as what is the range that this player falls in. But like, in retrospect, if a pick doesn't work out, it's hard to say like, well, the range of outcomes really dictated that we should have gone with this guy. Yeah. It's like, well, what worked and what didn't and why didn't it work or not? And that's why, you know, when you find an exception like that, like Marcus or Drew, guys who are not offensive like monsters but still provide all of this value you have to be willing to stand on it but when marcus was at oklahoma state he was not a good free throw shooter but he got himself to the line like non-stop and that wasn't a system that he had to fit within they fit the system around him which is a big difference than what kentucky does um and Drew was, I think, stuck behind Darren Collison, if I recall correctly, at UCLA. So he was sort of like a low minute kind of guy. And you didn't really know yet until he got to the league. But yeah, it makes me very interested to watch Case on. Yeah. I, I, like I think um, I think you'll like Thierro as well. I, I, I mean, I would I would give him a look. Definitely limited minutes this year. But um, any any glimpse you get at that high high school highlight tape that especially you'll just be like, wait a minute this this <laughs> this kid moves a little differently and he um he's very much a, i think he, if they played him more just their defense would be so much better and, and their team would be so much more free-flowing in transition just as he's a grab and go guy and you know similar to kind of how marcus smart is like he's kind of like a bulldozer like he he, yep. he kind of just not that he's like physically imposing you know the arrow six six and kind of just glides and just moves through people a little similar to you know he's kind of like a um, I don't know. He's kind of like a, just a smaller and a little bit less quickie version of like how the Thompsons kind of move. Like they glide, mm -hmm. like just, he's not as superior of an athlete, but like he's, he's a little tier below. And, and <laughs> I think those, I think these Kentucky guards, man, they're fun. Like Dillingham and Wagner next year are going to be really fun. But um, like you said, it's just, it, they're very difficult team to watch. Like it, it's extremely frustrating. Just every possessions like, so many different <laughs> things could be happening than what's going on right now. I love, I love the Wallace. No, you're good. I love the Wallace. We've talked about him a little bit, and I'm curious. Uh, again, same thing. I send you an email in a month. Hey, what you like about Wallace uh, when you're in the mood? But I, I think you'll one thing you'll notice, especially, and I think I've mentioned this to Caleb. If not, I was going to do it anyway. Um, he reminds me of Jalen Clark a lot from UCLA, yeah. Yeah. where obviously, even though Clark is six six listed, Wallace, I, I I like I love that Caleb said this. Like the Six four. I, I I would love to see what he actually is. I don't think he's actually six four. Right? He plays like he's bigger. Um, I wanted to like kind of poke a little bit on the Kentucky thing because I do love this because this class is frustrating the crap out of me, and I just want to know. I, I noticed that the Kentucky got to be in the right mood thing was like a sore spot. So I'd like to poke a little just just to see where you end up on this. 
what is something when you're evaluating that just other than Kentucky film, clearly, <laughs> that, what's something that frustrates you? Like, is there a certain, like, is there something in this process, not this, this year's process specifically, but in general, when you evaluate or you scout, is there something that just arcs you? Like, is there something that really understands this class specifically is what that is for me right now. But is there something that just always has bothered you that you're trying to overcome and improve yourself as an evaluator? Um, Interesting. Kentucky I mean, there, 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 there's a couple things. I mean, there can be just sort of discourse online that frustrates me. A lot of that frustrates me, but like I varying opinions. You mean like people not like, varying people. varying opinions are great. Okay, but yeah, okay, got the, that. The way that they can be expressed sometimes that can okay. be frustrating. Um, you know, kind of like bitter dunking yeah. on a prospect because someone was lower on them, and so you you know okay. that can be frustrating. But in terms of actually doing the work. And um, and like evaluating film, what can be frustrating if there's just um, if you know that a play if a player always does well in a, a a certain scenario, but because of their team, they just don't get to be in that lane that works for them. That annoys me. Like uh, if you think of. The, the opposite of this would be like Arizona. I love the way they use Benedict Mather, and I thought they really helped him grow his game. And he was very purposeful in growing his game there. And they had so many second side actions and had many had so many picks for him to either sprint off of or to use, you know, one and two dribbles and and swing or find cutters. Like, I thought it was a very, very, very good environment. Kentucky would be sort of at the other end of that. But I'm trying to think if there's similar team contexts that – I've seen that stick out for frustrating me. I don't like it, it might come to me, but one of the things that I like about doing this stuff is that I tend to only remember the stuff that I like and that, that makes me happy yeah. because I do yeah. like to do it. So I don't, I don't have like a great answer other than players in an, an incorrect context, but I, it's like the, Duke, for example, yeah. um, so Duke with AJ Griffin last year, I thought was kind of frustrating with how little they gave him to do for large portions of the year. And even when he started to pop a little bit, uh, they still used him mainly as a spacer because they wanted, you know, Roach, Keels, even Paolo to uh, dominate the ball so much. And I just wanted to see more of AJ Griffin. Um, but there's, you know, Other than there's probably a little corner and making yeah. it three. Yeah. And that's annoying it is. for sure because it's less information. But by the same token, you know, AJ was coming back from injury and who knows what he was really comfortable doing or not. Like, there's just a million other factors to it. So I hesitate. Like, Kentucky really has a body of work of doing this. And so I'm more Fair. comfortable <laughs> saying it about Kentucky. But, I mean, there's like little there's little pockets of it everywhere. Well, Caleb, he'll be frustrated when he watches the arrow. Cause he'll be like, Oh cool. Limited minutes. Really good guy. What the heck are they doing? Why are they not playing this guy more? Caleb yeah. put me in on the arrow. Oh, yeah. Um, Josh, my not Memphis last year. Oh, that's yeah. good. Another yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. He definitely is same, same van of player yeah. for sure. Um, the, yeah, just the, the, the under, the under, uh, the overperforming, yeah. undervalued by their to, own team to understand the inspiration of the question so if, if that if you run into this is i was telling caleb this the other day this class compared to last year and i'm not comparing classes is not like uh this class sucks this class doesn't that's not what this is but i felt a lot stronger about a lot more people whether it be positively or negatively last year i had 30 people last year i was 100 everybody in my first round i was 100 happy with and even guys into the like 31 to 40 range like the, even Nimhard. Nimhard didn't make my first 30 and I really regret it as an example yeah. but yeah. this class I was telling Caleb and Julian I have 16 people that I am absolutely 100% in love with and I'm trying to and the frustration part of it is where it comes into is I'm trying to just be more transparent with myself I'm newer to this that you know like a lot of us are right on the last couple of draft class right mine was 2020 was the first one so understanding anybody outside of my first 16 14 12 whatever the number is where I think those guys are my favorite understanding and trying to be more transparent with myself is the frustration right now and being like okay why why am i being so hard on x y and z person at 28 and like trying to figure out where i have them and be basically just frustrating being more 
being harder on myself and trying to be better at it. Can I ask you who your number 17 is? Who is your first person you were That's out funny. of love with? Uh, not completely, by the way, to be clear. There are <laughs> I know, things, right? I know, you know, 90%, know. 80%, whatever. Um, I th- that's why I do think it's a good question. I do think tears are important, and I'm starting to work on those now. Um, Chris Murray. We, we, we're, we're gonna... Chris is, okay. So Chris, Chris is Murray 17. is 17. Yeah. Like, And it sucks because I really like Chris Murray, right? After having a conversation with somebody recently, there was a guy that I brought to the conversation about Chris Murray. I'm glad that Caleb brought it up. I think it was a great uh, analogy. We were talking to him, and we were like, hey, you know, I, I brought up the Chris Murray thing. Why aren't we looking at Chris Murray and batting our eyes like we were Keegan? And I'll just – Stephen G, right? We know Stephen Gillespie. Yeah, dude. yeah. And he yeah. was like, well, you're talking to a guy who has Chris Murray at 14. And I went, now here's a conversation. You know, it's like <laughs> I, just batted, I just batted my eyes at him, you know, to talk to you about him. And next thing you know, you're telling me he's a lottery. So <laughs> so it's a good exa- – it, it, I like that. That's a good question. What, who is 17, right? It's like somebody that should probably be higher but could be lower depending on how the rest of the season goes. To, for, for me, that guy last year, I, I mean, and it's not that I didn't, I don't think of it in terms of who do I have a first round grade on because I, I probably should, but to me, I'll tear it out and then I'll have some formality of it. I'll yeah. I'll have some tear break between 28 and 35. And then whenever Fair. that happens, everyone below that is like a first round pick to me. But the, the, the guy who I had in the teens last year, that was the start of like the next tier where everyone else I thought was like a lot of talent. And he was the first next one was uh Bryce McGowan's. And I had, I, I know it's nice. unpopular because they lost so many games, but no, I, Caleb, uh, I loved Bryce McGowan. Yeah, so did I. Caleb and I were talking, or I was talking to Julian before I, we got on the pod here. I have Bryce McGowan's at twenty six after last year was all said and done. Yeah, I had him. I had him in the twenties. I, was, that was ta- I thought that was taboo. I'm glad that we all agree here. I mean, yeah. This is a Bryce McGowan's podcast now. So. <laughs> I mean, he's he's not in the best uh, organization. Yeah, but I mean, he is like, unfortunately the dude. I mean, yeah. he's just a, such a superior athlete. Uh, I mean, to a lot of the guys. I'm excited the- to see him if he plays next month. I'm going to a Swarm game. I'm hoping that he'll play because they they keep bringing him up and down. Like, just make a decision. Let the guy play in the G League or not. Like, just <laughs> let him just own everybody. Like Caleb said, he's owning the G League right now. He's just – anyway. Yeah, I got to see him in person last year for Lofton, an extra Lofton, 20 minutes. Lofton's so. another guy that, for yeah. me, was like – I was very firm on the fact that I thought that he was an NBA talent. And I didn't yep. really – the time I didn't – I didn't really know where to put him in my board, but he's been another guy that he's putting up 30 consistently in the G League. I think w- what you have with him um, is that the, even, I mean, he's in a great organization, obviously, but I don't even think the NBA knows what to do with him or how to use him. And that's not, it's not to say that I do. I'm not saying that I do, but clearly talented to get buckets on like the best players in the world. Um, he forced Chet Holmgren. I yeah. mean, I don't know. I don't know if many people remember that Team USA U18 yeah. team. They were both yeah. on it, but he he. There's I've seen videos of those scrimmages where he made Chet Holmgren look like a child. Mm-hmm. And, and so and- it's just where because like all sports leagues, NBA is a copycat league, and so teams don't like to experiment on like like the not everyone is the toronto raptors being like well we're we're going to purposefully zag in this direction because we think that there's something here so if you know kenny doesn't fit in a traditional off ball shooter mold playing around other stars and if he's not that well then are we going to try to develop ken kenny as a star how does that work like it's just it's so much easier for very a similar team. to the ball ball experiment where you really have yeah. to come to it it's it's very he's very much at that I, and it's i hate to call him a novelty player but like That's what the, he is though like it is like he is. and i think that you're, we're going to see a version of that player though that could be a a good player in Keyshawn Hall um a guy for UNLV is 67 250 player with guard skills um limited minutes again another guy <laughs> like a very major caleb miller freshman sleeper deep cut but what i want to i know that um we've talked for a while and i really appreciate the time they have we didn't even get to some of the stuff that i wanted to talk to because we kind of touched on so many great anecdotes from past drafts and you know honestly i, I think it's great to look back and I, it's definitely helped me learn i've learned a lot today i'm sure trevor has as well and we're very thankful no likewise thank, thank you guys very much um so to kind of wrap it up, I want you to rank um, these three of my darts, of my darts for this draft process <laughs> so far. Um, Jalen Clark, Jalen Wilson, and Jalen Slauson. <laughs> the three Jalens. Okay, rank them. 
rank yeah. them. Or you don't even have to rank them. No, just- no, 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 no. Ranking it, ranking them is the difficult, fun thing to do. I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll rank them. I'll say, um, God, <laughs> I love the deliberation. <laughs> J- D- Wilson and Clark is difficult for me. I, I like Slauson, but I would not have him. I might, ma- I mean, I don't know. I would not have him first. I would, but between Clark, I want to say Jalen Clark. That is yeah. who I want to say. The I'm only at, reason I'm at 15 only... right now. I'm a okay. I'm, I'm a huge like I I just think the skill set, the tools, the way they finish it inside, the efficiency. I, I, so so I... he was in my head when we were talking about Dalen Terry, and he's had more scoring pop than Dalen had, you know, oh, yeah. this time last year. But he is also a junior. Dalen was a sophomore. With him, love obviously his athleticism, his defense. UCLA has coached him clearly very well because they're a very well coached team. Um, the the issue with him is similar to it's how does he like to score? What does he like to do? And what I see him doing a lot is either transition, semi transition, or if he thinks he has like a mismatch in the post, he'll try to dive and catch and finish. If he gets something where he's going downhill. He just, you know, he likes to drive and just sort of jump and shoot over everyone a lot of the time. And he's very right hand dominant and wouldn't be the first player who is, you know, very strong hand dominant to come in and succeed in the league. But with Tiger there, unless he gets a lot of reps up doing um, pick and roll and maybe he has, and I haven't seen it. Maybe yeah, the... I'll say that there has, there has been some pick and roll stuff, but it's off of a lot of the stuff that you're saying where it's him already coming down here. They set it up very well. Like you said, very yeah. well coached team. It's normally him coming off a handoff and then it's a secondary screen that they're able to get him downhill going around. So there's, you know, he's already got kind of a two-step edge on his guy because he is right hand dominant. Like you said, you know, when he's going left, he's, you know, he's, putting that ball right in the middle of the paint and kind of just, he's got yeah. that leg to finish over players at this level, but. So, yeah. So that's my question with him is if he, and ent- if, if it's still just here and there for pick and roll and it's mainly finishing plays in this other way, which it very might well remain because UCLA is good as it like really good. I think they're very, very good. Then um, he would have what I would think of as sort of, a hybrid of a Dalen Terry, Jaden Springer issue. Jaden Springer, incredible defensive prospect and player as a freshman, entered the league younger, has had huge moments in the G League, is not in a good developmental organization. So I hesitate to say everyone with that skill set is going to encounter the same hurdles. But if he um if he doesn't, I think being six five and not six eight, you know, he's not Tari Eason sized. Tari can get away with playing mismatch ball at his size and coming in and still finding ways to get on the court early. Unless Jalen um varies the ways in which he scores, I think that his first year or two in the league will be a struggle. However, I think that his ceiling is probably still the highest out of those three. Yeah. Wilson is a very interesting player to me because he um, maybe people have been saying this about him and I've just missed it. I don't know. But when I watch him, I just to me, he's just a guard. And I think the the temptation is to be like he's a wing and he does wing stuff. He's six, eight. This is, you know, a three and D player or someone who's working on a shot. But almost every finish of his is below the rim that I ever see the, the moves that he likes to go to are sort of below the rim adjustment finishes. He gets himself to the line. Well, but he likes to drive to pass mm-hmm. probably because he I doesn't have it. A... I think it's great. I, I think all three of, I think him and McCuller, like I wanted to talk to you about McCuller as yeah. well. They both do a very great job of driving to pass. Um, and I think color, especially in uh, McCuller in transition. And, you know, I, if you do want to sme- sneak a little time in there to talk about him, but, some of the stuff that both those guys are able to do in transition because they can pass and they're so willing to pass. Mm -hmm. It makes them both way more interesting as big guard prospects. Wouldn't you say? It does. And it like being willing to drive to pass, which is, you know, Brown, Christian Brown last year's Kansas team was excellent at Mm -hmm. Um, it. That gives you a 
a clean lane to succeed in the NBA and to, and to maybe eventually start in the NBA if you're really good at driving to pass, if you can really hit your threes. Because when you look at the competition for spots on NBA teams, there are not many players who get lots of minutes in the league um, who are non-rim protectors who can't drive to pass. If, if you can't do that and you're consistently just driving to get your own bucket, I mean, you better be really good at getting your own bucket because chances are you'll head to the bench and then you'll be more fungible as a player. But I, I'll bring up Grimes again because he's really, really good at driving to pass, but he also was a historic high-volume three-point shooter in college. Yep. And so I think that with with Jalen and Kevin's shots still not quite there. You know, I like Jalen, I think as a sort of sturdier athlete, I like his form a little bit more than I like Kevin's. Um, it's just gonna, that is going to have to hit for him in order for what he likes to do the most on offense, which is drive to pass. I mean, maybe not. I mean, he does average 20 a game, but yeah. He's, in order the for that to play up, been fantastic. The mid range yeah. has been fantastic. I think just most of everything that he's done off the dribble this year, I think, has um, definitely, from my from my perspective and from my evaluation, solidifies him as a guy that should be in the first round conversation, and I think will be in, in the player of the year conversation throughout the whole season. Yeah. So it's like, what do you prefer to develop as an NBA team? If you just think, if you have Fred Vincent, and you think we can make sure that Jalen Wilson shoots at an acceptable level you could take him and then you take advantage of the rest of his skill set but he's never he is not going to be a weak side rim protector because he just doesn't have the bounce to do I that if you, i think if you're able to take him or jalen clark and you're able to just improve their shooting like both of them you say which guy can i take but let's say let's say plus the three-point rating by seven i'm taking <laughs> i'm taking jalen clark every time that's yeah. what I'm saying. And that's why I I would probably rank him first, but I think his development on an NBA team is kind of thorny. I think I a team think really a needs great, to know what they're a, doing. He's a great second Raptors first round pick. Um yeah. after <laughs> after they take one of the Thompsons. You'll have, um, you'll yeah. have me second think, guessing myself. I think, I think, I think Wait, Trevor, where are you on, on him? Well, you you both that's what I was about to say. You both have me second guessing myself because I have Wilson at eighteen and Clark at nineteen. <laughs> so I'm kind of like <laughs> crap, you know. I'm sitting here looking at my board the whole time y'all were talking going the heck am i doing you know <laughs> i don't know we'll see it's not finished yet it's going out january 1st so we'll see and then oh the really you got like a, you've got a release for it? that's awesome man yeah I, that's really I, cool. I do it a little bit different i think we do it a little bit similarly where it's like you, you i think we pace ourselves a little bit like okay cool the nba we talked about a little bit it's like oh I, I really start cranking january 1st like that's when i'm like all right these guys have had plenty of play non-conference international mm -hmm. guys have played a good slate g league this year we, we get a showcase between now and then, which is dope, obviously. Scoot Henderson, we don't need any more film on him at this point. But, you know, <laughs> the point being is it's nice to, for me, at least the way as like a weekly, hopefully, content creator, it's I try to pace myself and, and know when I can structure the best stuff between January, February, March, because March Madness, the NBA Finals of June, you know. I have to be very careful of, like, overdoing it. <laughs> like, all right, cool. <laughs> January 1st, big board, that's the day. Don't worry. You know, nothing else matters between now and Christmas Eve or uh, awesome. New Year's Eve or whatever. But, yeah. Um, Y'all yeah. have me second guess myself. Thanks for that. I'm gonna finish. Here, that Caleb I, and Trevor too. If you're a fan of his, make the case for Slauson. Okay. Um, I've seen him in person see, for what it's Trevor worth. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll give I'll give the like the more nuanced like scouting perspective on him. I'd say that the biggest thing that solidifies him as a prospect is his defensive ability. I think mm -hmm. that he's he is an NBA level athlete. I think that he'll come in. And at the defensive end, he'll be able to guard. I think he can guard, you know, one through five. Like, I think that he can step out and, and switch on to guys on the perimeter. I think he's a, a switchable defender at all five positions. Um, you know, has great footwork. Um, his lateral movements are exceptional. Like, I, and then also he's got just great timing and an IQ. He knows where he needs to be when uh, his shot blocking timing is exceptional. I mean, Trevor got to see it firsthand. Um, a chase to a legitimate LeBron James level chase down block guy where like he's got the, yes. yeah. nu the nuanced like where he really can just, you know, see the next like seven steps. And I think that, um, you know, that on the defensive end, that's where he like he's him on the defensive end. 
as far as as far as as far as mid major. I hate that though. I would. I know what you mean, but I hate that. Well, as far <laughs> you know as I hate as, the thing. as far as defensive mid major goes prospect, to fur him. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's the. I think I think he's the first. Um, I think he's the number one defensive mid major prospect in this year's draft class. Offensively, I think he's a modern four. I think that he does a lot of the things that you're you have expectations. You know, I talked about. Um, guys being able to, you know, put up a certain amount of an assist rate. He's a great assist rate for a guy who's a six foot seven power forward, or really, you know, at times plays the center position um, on the perimeter for Furman. Plays it he's, way more than he should. A lot, for what it's lot of DH, a lot of DHOs. You know, um, I think th- that's the main appetite of his offensive touches, post ups. Great passer, has great vision. Um, you know, he can pretty much make almost every pass, cross court, one handed kind of sling passes can do the little backdoor Furman's offense is mostly backdoor cuts. So, I mean, he's got those little backdoor feeds down pat, but the shooting, I mean, he's uh, been shooting really well his last couple of games. I mean, this year he's shooting 36% from three and last year he shot like pretty much around the same rate, if not the exact same rate where they are right now. But, um, you know, Trevor got to see a game in person where he shot very, very poorly, but a lot of the, a lot of the mentality stuff has grown over the last couple of years Four year player. I mean, I will, Five-year player. I will, five year, yeah, five-year five year technically. So I will, I will spare you some of it because there, are, I, for the on the clock listeners, it would be a, it would be me beating a dead horse. But I will say this: going into it, I, I wanted to watch him more than anyone on the court because I've seen Turk enough. So I'm like, okay, this is the guy I am watching. You know, I am, you know, I was courtside, so it was like, okay, this is what I'm getting to see. Um, the shooting numbers, the shooting things, everything about the shot, I am genuinely concerned. And at this point, I would love to say he's a first round prospect for me that decision is uh, is undone until January 1st. But there are things I told Caleb very, very clearly. There are things if you get to see people in person, there's there's things that you just sometimes don't see on film. I, I think it's so important, the in-person scouting of prospects. And he's a guy where I went, you know, I know he's athletic, but how athletic? And there was, I told Caleb, this is a beating a dead horse thing, but he caught a ball outside of the rectangle, okay, an alley oop, <laughs> and it, you can find it. It's like the last on synergy, last six minutes of the game. Like, they were down by a lot. State Which was one game? of the most switchable. Uh, the NC State game. NC State, NC State yeah. against Turk. So they, NC State is one of the most switchable teams in the country. It's not the style of defense Furman's is used to seeing. In you know whatever the Southern Conference, right? They're not playing the most stellar teams, unfortunately. Hey, but long bro. story short, athletically outside of the rim, he is grabbing a ball and able to complete it at six seven. Like that is something that you see like six eleven guys with seven four wingspans do. It's unbelievable. Um, but there are things intangibly on defense. I think he's one of the best switchable defenders. Caleb made a good point there. But there are just some things I got to see with hips and the way he moves and the way he's able to recover if he, for some reason, is blown by, um, which didn't happen often. But I am in for the sake of I don't believe in the shot, but I do believe in what a team will want as a valuable defender and as a valuable switcher. However, I don't think that's in the first round right now. Compare him athletically to Herb from Alabama. I think he's slightly more athletic because I think Herb, there are things he can do with his hands and with his eyes and with his brain. I think Herb's really intelligent. Obviously, I think that's a huge thing for him on defense. Um, I love the example. I've made that example before. Um, I think it's hard to compare them because there are things Herb Jones, I, it's so tough because Herb Jones got to play a lot better def, a lot better offensive players right. a lot of times. So I think he right. had to, I think he learned from his, his mistakes a lot because I think Herb Jones got to play against a lot of SEC competition that was very tough. And anything he, especially when you play teams twice, um, I I saw a huge jump for when Herb Jones played, you know Auburn the first time, and then or whatever. I think the you'd rather time, have right? Herb Jones. I think you'd rather. I have would. Herb yeah, hundred percent. Guard, guard guards. And I think mm-hmm. if you're the guy who can guard the four and be a outside yeah. rim protector, I think you take Slauson. Yep. Because I, when I've watched Slauson, I think it's out of necessity for Furman's needs. They have him guard low a lot uh-huh. and yeah, too much. That and that sort and. By the same token, on offense, he seems to be like really wants to buy into the offense and everything. But I've seen him try to get get the ball in sort of the mid post and immediately look for the cutter to pass rather than assess yeah. his own matchup and see yeah. if he can take that it's, guy. It's, it's the biggest. It's the biggest frustration thing yep. I'd say is being, um, you know, a Jalen Slauson, you know, Truther. Fall. Would be the word I would use. Truther would be the word I would use. I am. I mean, I I think that 
you know, he, and I talked about it in the last time we spoke about him on a pod. That's just like the mentality thing with him. He's just, he's one of those players where he really needs to figure out how to be able to get the healthy appetite of looking to facilitate and looking to be aggressive. Yeah. And when he, when he is able to find that happy medium, um, he becomes a really, really explosive player. Like he had a 24 point game um, right before the NC state game. It was the game before. Yeah. So kind of, if you want, you want to go and it's a, it's a great arc to see kind of how he is as a player game to game, um, kind of seeing the, the game before the game, the NC state game, and then watching the game after he went four for seven from three after going mm-hmm. one for seven. Yeah. So, I mean, he's just very much like, but he's getting there. Like I've noticed it's improved just this season because they've played tougher schedules. They are our really good team. Bothwell is an exceptional guard um, at the college level. So, um, you know, they're having to play some tougher competition. I think he's, he's starting to figure out that he is kind of an NBA prospect or should can be, can think of himself in that way yeah. and is playing with some more assertiveness. And um, it's definitely been a thing that's grown over the past couple of weeks, I think. Caleb, yeah, thing- I Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. One Sorry. thing to think about too, Caleb, like this, because we talked about it already, like you said on a previous spot. But like one thing I thought about a lot with the way Furman, I'd love to watch more Furman games. I'll watch them down the stretch, especially in the Southern. They're going to be in the tournament, man. They're going to be if they win out. They should. They absolutely should win their tournament. They were obviously a, a loss short last year. But my point with Slauson was the. I think that his process, and maybe Chuck will appreciate this. I think his process is going to be really beneficial if he if he performs really well in workouts and things that are not firm and film based because that was the one glaring thing about them was and it's one game for me but one thing I was like they just this is their set and this is they're going to stick to it and that's all they're going to like they don't let him do any of that stuff like they don't let him unlock so it's like he's going to really benefit from people understanding his raw talent especially the three of us uh, here but seeing him later in like April, May, June when they're not playing in conference tournaments or in the SLA tournament and he's really focusing working out with teams and this combine and things like that, he's going to really benefit from people seeing him be allowed to do those things, right? And then obviously the Metro the ball on the love floor. to see that. Yeah. But the thing but here's the thing that's that, going to be important for me. As a fifth year guy in a uh at Furman at a mid-major the, I doubt, now I haven't done this research, but I doubt there's a lot of historical precedent for the, a team holding a player like that back at the mid-major level at his age. If you compare sure. it to uh, Roddy at Colorado State last year, who's a much different athlete, but you could see how, like Colorado State, they, I mean, and they had Isaiah, I forget his last name. Their guard is good and will play professionally somewhere. Um, Stevens, Isaiah Stevens. Yeah. Um, he's, he's but they, a, what's up? He's having a good year. Yeah, and they also have Taviante Jackson, who's a freshman, who's awesome. Yeah, so like last year they were like, well, this guy's obviously, like you, you can play within the system, but he also got his threes up. He shot really well from three last year, but they leaned into Roddy's skill set and whatever Roddy struck the usage that he was comfortable with because he was so talented, like whatever shots he wanted to take, he took. So there's a real question to me as to whether or not Furman is, this is a function of Furman's offense, or this is a function of what Slauson is comfortable with. So that's really what I, like I will it. be interested to see as it as it goes on. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's and I, I think, by the way, to y'all's point about workouts and doing well, this would seem to be a guy that like the Grizzlies guarantee in like February. Like, don't worry, we'll take you at thirty. <laughs> February? Yeah, like they'll just like it. you know uh, whenever they're allowed to. Yeah, I yeah. I don't want to. Like, I don't wink, wink. You know, <laughs> but like the, it, the, yeah. they'll be ahead of the curve on him yeah. because his his stats will pop, especially yeah, his percentages from two really yeah. pop. His defense pops, and they'll just. I like the Grizzlies comp though. It's good. Yeah, I, I like mean it. that's it, that's sort the sort of guy that they just very quietly make sure we're going to bring you into our program. But yeah. Roddy, clearly that's what they did with Roddy. They were like, okay, no. well, so we're taking Roddy, it. <laughs> Vince Williams, LaRavia. I mean, these yeah. are all different players, but you, you, yeah. it's the same sort of idea. Yeah. 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 I like it. Trying to, get, trying to get that cutting edge, you know, switchable wing who, who can pass the ball, you know, yeah. except well for their position. Yeah. I, I think that's excellent. Um, well, we thank you for the time, but I think, one last thing we want to get quick. The I think we're trying to make this a tradition here on the pod, especially at this point in the season when it's so early to make such egregious predictions. But who's your title pick for NCAA and NBA? Uh, um, okay, champions in both. I will say um, 
money on the line now. Who is it? Who, who, who <laughs> yeah, are you taking? Please, please. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Um, it's tough. It's, you know? it's funny. I would say uh, I'll take UCLA. I like UCLA a lot. See, you alluded to that earlier, and I was like, uh oh. I was like, is he going to think that? I was like, uh oh. But, but a lot of that, uh, let me tell you, like a it. lot of that is coming from a. I've watched them and I haven't watched everyone. Okay. But I really, I mean, UCLA obviously was a Final Four team a couple of years ago. They have, um, it depends on how well Juzang played. If Juzang like puts together a really good tournament and like his, his shot is falling because it really can come and go for him. Then I think they could beat anyone very clearly with how well they are. Campbell's coached. that good. Campbell's but, that good of a point guard. I mean, yeah, point and guard, it, I think point guard play is especially what I'm thinking about this time of year, and I think that's a he's one of the best college point guards in the country by far. And, and um, th- so I, I mean, that's a NBA. pick. It's it's an uninformed pick, but that would be my pick. And um, I've view, UConn for like similar reasons. I think that they just they are they're ex- coached extremely well. They have a lot of the the areas where um, it, you know, they have a lot of sure areas like they have Klingon and Sonogo inside. And I think if Sonogo has a stretch where he becomes you know that player who's the one of the best players you know t- top thirty player in the country type of level, I think that uh, well, and UConn they're gonna be my watch like this week. I want to watch because I was a fan of uh, Tristan Newton's last year. Tristan Newton, let's go. Yeah, so I I'm very excited to see them. Um, as far as NBA goes, title pick. Oh man, um, I mean the boring answer is Milwaukee. I'll just say Milwaukee. Yeah, guy, no, we won't clip this and and it's that. okay. We definitely <laughs> won't clip this. In three I months. like if I were to do like a more fun pick that I I bluffs over Grizz. Right. What's up? Bucks over Grizz. That was my preseason pick, and I'm still staying with it. God, the Grizz? The Grizz yeah. in the finals? Do you think they stay healthy enough? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. When they, when they are healthy I don't know though, who the fun pick is, you said. Who's the fun pick? I, I, have, a, I have my idea who I think it is. but Yeah, I don't know. Fun pick. Does Denver give me, give me a you? second. Does Denver entice you by any means? They that's the that's the name that's in my head. <laughs> okay. But I don't know if I want to go that far. Talk about like, injury for the Grizzlies. Good grief. Porter had Porter hasn't played in thirty days, you know? Oh uh, well, I mean, I don't know that I mean that it might be a blessing in disguise. Um <laughs> Ah God. I love it. I love if it. there's a it, I mean, no, I there's no pick that's really, really fun, uh, truthfully, where I'm like, no one will see this coming. Uh yeah. I don't. I don't think I have one right now. I mean, I guess maybe Brooklyn, but is that really fun? Is it fun if the Brooklyn not fun for anyone to win the title? <laughs> no. So I don't know. I, I'll stick with the Bucks. What do you guys think? You said Bucks over Grizz, Trevor. Who would you think? I have the I have the Bucks as well. I who I have against them. I at this point could literally be a bloodbath. I don't really have a who against yeah, I'm a, them. I'm a Suns fan. I really want the Suns to get there, but I just. Too many things. Yeah. yeah. And, well, and the thing Sounds with Bucks the is what I would say. The thing with the Bucks is I I have serious uh, questions as to how healthy Middleton is really going to be this year if he ever really looks like himself. And if that's the case, then they're, I mean, they are beatable. I don't want to say very beatable because Giannis is Giannis, but they've got a big game on uh, Sunday, Christmas. Who Day. do they, they play? The Celtics at five o'clock. There Round you go. Time. Skip dinner, everybody. Watch that and, game for two and a half hours. <laughs> and Celtics is this I mean, injuries is the same issue with them between Horford and uh, Rob Williams. Is how healthy are they going to be and how healthy will they remain? But yeah, I I, I want to make a, a like a Clippers case, but these are like also preseason favorites. So like again, I'm not. It's not much of a dart, but yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. Yeah. All right. Well, we really appreciate your time. Um, I mean, not that um, like. I think that, you know, people will probably know who you are if they if they see the title and are, are listening, especially to this point. I think they would have enjoyed the conversation and probably are familiar with your work, Chuck. But if they aren't, for those aren't, do you want to uh, plug yourself a little bit? I will include links and everything in the description. I'm normally pretty good. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Chucking Darts, NBA and Draft Podcasts, wherever you get them, you'll find them. I'm not great at promoting my podcast. So if you follow me on Twitter at Chucking Darts, I that's where they are tweeted out if you don't subscribe but please subscribe and then you don't have to follow my dopey twitter account thank you guys <laughs> very much yeah yeah of course thank you for joining us um yeah I mean we had a great conversation lots of draft stuff lots of basketball talk obviously um and we're off the clock <laughs>